first thank you all <laughs> this is my door to y'all <laughs> well we just praise god and give god all glory on behalf of pastor stevens and myself we just like to welcome you and we just thank you all for coming out uh, we know there's going to be uh, information to share at this event and we just pray that god bless this event and the purpose for this event is about all about you man and the health Amen. So we just thank you once again and welcome. And if there's anything that we can do for you, just let us know. And we just give God glory. We give God praise that he has brought uh, we are all of us together at Councilman Tate to come out and to share uh, with us and give us information that is well needed. So we just give God glory and we just give God praise. Thank you, Sister Amen. Amen. I am in good hands, y'all. I'm in good hands. So here we are, a quick history of Pure Word Missionary Baptist Church. On Sunday, March 15, 1987, a group of committed Christians answered the call of God and formed the New Assembly of God Missionary Baptist Church under the anointed leadership of Dr. F.B. Thompson. Within a year, we, the New Assembly of God Missionary Baptist Church, through Christ, generated enough funds to purchase our own worship facility there at 161. Uh, 16101 Schaefer. The diligent, faithful efforts of, a faith, of faithful members allowed us to pay off the building in a few years. That's a big deal, you guys. Under the leadership of Pastor Thompson, the Lord continued to bless us in many ways, allowing the ministry to grow and flourish. On November 1st, 1999, Pastor Thompson retired as pastor of New Assembly of God Missionary Baptist Church on November 28, 1999. Reverend Samuel Stevens was installed as pastor by Reverend Dr. Jim Holly of the historic Little Rock Missionary Baptist Church. Pastor Samuel Stevens, walking in humility and love, was moved by the Holy Spirit to promote and honor Dr. Freddie Thompson and Dr. Jasper Stevens to the position of senior pastors. The Lord blessed them to guide him with much wisdom, and they remained loyal friends and mentors until their transition. The Lord inspired us to change our name to Pure Word Missionary Baptist Church on June 1st, 2000. On July 6, 2008, through the act of crazy faith, the Lord led our church family to 20011 Grand River to serve community, rebuild lives, and preach a word of healing and deliverance. The Lord continues to bless and reward the faithful of our congregation, and we are forever faithful and grateful to our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and hallelujah. So, that is the quick history of who we are here. We're all about community. How many of you all know that we have food bank? We serve people here weekly. We give our food here weekly. We're about the least of these and those who just need to know the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is how I'll end, uh, Councilman, real quick. Uh, starting on next sun Saturday, next Saturday, we're going to start our very first drive through prayer right here on the east side of the church. That's going to be amazing, right? If you wake up one morning, you feel like, wow, God, I don't know. Where I can just pull up in my car and get a word of encouragement. So that's going to be amazing. So I encourage you all to join us on next Saturday. Drive up, get your prayer. That's a great way to start your day from 12 to 2 on next Saturday. And again, thank you all. And on behalf of our pastor, we love you and we welcome our doors to you anytime. Join us on service. We have service. Got to get that in. We have service here on Sundays. <laughs> There's a, uh, uh, we do Sunday school at 9.30 right now for June. I'm the teacher, so you got maybe one more Sunday to come and hear me teach. And then it's always every Sunday, 9.30, and then service starts at 10.30. Amen? God bless you all, and welcome again. And we want to thank, uh, again, uh, Pastor Stevens for allowing us to be in the church today. So, uh, it is early morning. Let me ask a question. How many of you got a little... Uh, 
see another one back there. All right. So let me ask another question. What are some of the benefits of exercise? Anybody? Benefits of exercise? Long life. Long life. Okay. Anybody else? Lower your blood pressure. More flexibility. Heart health. Heart health. <laughs> Stamina. Anybody else? Weight, Weight loss. loss. I was wondering, come on, man. I was wondering, that one. The brain. Still working on it. The brain. The brain. Maintaining your strength. Maintaining your strength. I was going to pull out my little notes here, but y'all get everything. So they, you all are already doing it. So that's a great thing. Uh, what we want to do today is showcase and highlight. We had a few months ago one of our local gyms that had moved into uh, District 1 and we wanted to welcome them uh, into our community with our Discover D1 initiative. Uh, we actually had a few folks who ended up joining that particular facility. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Today we have another one. This one is by a gentleman by the name of J.C. Jones, just moved into the District on Nichols. Uh, Reggie, I want you to play this video, and by the time we finish, I'm guaranteeing this. I'm J.C. Jones, and welcome to J.C. Jones Bootcamp. The most gratifying thing about seeing my clients transform is the fact of watching lives change. Well, I got my starting training in 2003. Uh, what had happened was I had gotten to where I was about 295, uh, borderline diabetic, uh, borderline hypertension, I had cholesterol issues, the one that put me on all kinds of medications, and I just decided to make a change. So the more I began to work out, the more I found that I fell in love with the idea of fitness again. Um, and then what happened was I began to help people without knowing while I was in the gym and went through my own 12 week transformation, uh, 65 pounds that I lost and suddenly was no longer uh, in danger of diabetes or hypertension or heart disease or any of that. Um, I started helping people in the gym and would catch side eyes from these guys who didn't know what the problem was. Then someone told me they were personal. personal trainers, they got paid to do what I was doing before. And I did that in 2003, and it's been uh, just a wonderful ride ever since, as I really love the idea of helping people to understand the importance of diet and exercise. I've been coming to J.C. Jones for um, well, actually over four years now, and the experience that I did is awesome. The training, the attention, um, it has transformed my life. Uh, my blood pressure before I came, actually, I was borderline going into hypertension. But I came mainly because I wanted to keep my weight down. But the actual greater effect was my blood pressure went down. And now I have a normal blood pressure because of me getting that activity. August of 2017, uh, I joined J.C. Jones Boot Camp with a goal of uh, getting in shape and getting in better health and uh, within three months I, I got into a rhythm where uh, I started to see some results of clothes fitting a little loosely and um, clothes feeling like they're, they're trying to trade them in for some smaller things to buy. Um, continuing with the diet within six months I was able to drop down to over 50 50 plus pounds, and uh, I continue the journey today with a goal of trying to drop an additional 20. And so that's my mission right now, is to continue to pass on to uh, health and prosperity, and it all starts here. We here at J.C. Jones Bootcamp want you to come by and experience what you've already heard about. We already know there are people that have been out there for years watching us, wanting to get a part of it. You need to come and check this thing out for yourself. In fact, we like to say around here, you need to come and get yourself. Bottom line is, you can dream it, you can bring it to pass, you just got to put a deadline on it. If you're able to come in and give it your all, we can help you get where you're going. Act right, proceed right, you just get right. And there's no challenge, no change. 
Quit focusing on the end and take the job from the Have a great day. J.C. Jones, come forward, please. Mr. J.C. Jones, boot camp. How you doing, sir? Good to see you. Thank you for coming again. So this is our Discover D1 initiative. We come by and knock on the door. You look pretty new over there at that location. If you're located, just so folks will know, it's, between, it's on McNichol, between Southfield and Greenfield. Yep. Just to give you a little rough idea of where you're located. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you gave us a little bit on the video, but tell us a little bit about yourself and why should these folks come out to see you as opposed to all these other folks that are out there up in train Well, I'm JC Jones. Um, we started the camp about 10 years ago. Um, I've been training people in either martial arts or, uh, or weight training since I was 10. That's 41 years now, going on 42. Um, back in 2000, and to, like, it, like the video said, I took control of my own health. And told me I was borderline diabetic, borderline hypertension, um, cholesterol levels were through the roof, and then I was going to go on medications, and I had a problem with that. And then looking at that, I began to take my, the, I was already working out, but I began to take the other end, which is the diet end, more seriously. And in three months, I dropped 65 pounds. Uh, doing a diet program similar to one we set up later on for my own camp. Um, 2003, I decided to become a personal trainer and um, started at Powerhouse Rosedale, actually, uh, which was where the old, I guess, the right aid is now. Um, and met with immediate success. We had folk dropping 60 pounds in 12 weeks and 40 pounds and that's eight weeks and so on and so forth. And the big thing was, it was more so not just the exercise, but it was more so the education about diet. So um, fast forward up to 2008, and people are losing jobs. People are moving down south, the economy's bad. And I'm beginning to feel the, the pinch of it, and I'm wanting to be able to offer the personal training type of, of experience where people can afford it. I knew about boot camps, but I knew they were expensive, right? And I was trying to find a way to make what I do affordable for a mass number of people. As I always said, personal training is like uh, it's like having a Ferrari, and a gym membership is like having a Volkswagen. Both of them will get you home, one will get you there a lot faster, it costs a lot more. Right? So what I did was I took that Ferrari, put made it a school bus, and if you don't mind sharing, right, sharing the sharing the ride, you get there just as fast. And that's what we came up with. And we started in the Powerhouse Gym parking lot in Southfield. Um, um, and from there we moved on to a park, from there to a Jenkins Construction Building downtown, and from there to Finkel and Linwood, where we stayed for nine years and saw great successes. But we came over this way um, because of the fact that one of our clients uh, owns a taco bar now, which is over around the street from us, and she suggested, hey, this is a great area, great traffic, that, so on and so forth. Where I was, nobody knew we were there. Only reason people came was because they saw on Instagram, on Facebook, their friends and, and things that happened. Uh, but here is wonderful, right between St. Mary's and Murray Hill. We had great traffic, people see us all the time, and there's a need, all right? Uh, the reason that we're in the area we're in and been in the areas we've been in in all, all these years is because uh, in these urban areas, you don't get the education. What's the difference between us and getting a gym membership? Very simple. Education, inspiration, motivation. All right? At our gym, we educate you about diet and exercise, the importance of diet and the importance of exercise. We educate you about well, how to watch what you eat and watch what's going into your mouth. Now, I'm going to hit you with something. Your car has specific gasoline, specific oil, specific transmission fluid, specific brake fluid, and we pay attention to everything that goes in that car. We pay extra money to make sure we get uh, uh, the right oil changes. And uh, I had a car, I had to give it $120 for oil change every few months, and we did that to make sure that car ran correctly. 
Well, we got a saying around Jason Jones boot camp, you can't put your brain in a book bag. All right. And your, your body is your vehicle, and you only get one. And so it becomes imperative that we learn how to take care of it because a lot of the things they put in the food that we take in on the norm on a daily basis is something to kill you. Bottom line. Um, I had a goober fetish. Go to movies, get a pack of goobers. Go go Dallas store, get a pack of goobers before I go to movies. Make sure I had goobers every time I went to movies, go to movies every other week. And during one of our challenges, um, I decided, okay, I'm gonna stop eating the goobers. Let me go and read the back of the package. Read the back of the package. One of the last items, the preservative, the last items, causes paralysis, nerve damage, vision impairment. That's a pack of goobers. So if we're not paying attention to what we're eating, we could be taking in things that are causing cancer and setting us up for other things in that so on and so forth. So we educate you about reading labels. We go to grocery store field trips, cooking camps. We do seminars. Uh, we do challenges. We've got one starting up next week, in fact. That's a, that's a challenge where everybody follows a diet program implicitly for a period of time. The person who loses the most wasted weight uh, gets, uh, gets money. Or wins money, and so that's always a great incentive because you put deadlines on, on, on goals. But we teach you about educate, about educate you about diet and exercise. Then the next thing is inspiring you. It's it's getting with you and letting you know you count, you matter. You're not just a number. You're not just a member city, but we got numbers. We know who you are. We know where you are, and we're watching and making sure that you're going to get through. Nobody walks in there and. And, and, and leaves not without being victorious. In other words, when you're struggling, somebody next to you is gonna help you struggle. And that's a big thing. And then of course, there's the motivation factor. And that is where literally uh, we stay connected with each other. Because connection is everything. On the outside, a lot of people aren't trying to do what you're trying to do. So on the inside, we make sure that you've got connection to people who have similar like-minded goals, like-minded desires and care about what they're doing, about their bodies, about their, about the generations really, all right? And we all inspire each other and motivate each other to keep it going, keep it moving. And then as if, you, if you ever get on my page, Jason Jones underscore bootcamp, you'll see it constantly. We're talking about how you can make it and what you can do with what you got. So what makes us different? We care. And we have the tools, we have the resources to, to help you get there. Um, just a couple quick testimonies we've had. Young lady come to us, 362 pounds, um, 14 medications, malignant brain tumor, uh, dropped in 10 months, 212 pounds, five years later, okay, five years later, five years later, she's still about 30 pounds above what, what she got dropped down to. My own daughter dropped 110 in five months. Uh, we just had a young man drop 65 inside of 12 weeks. This, this thing can happen, it's healthy, you can do it, but you just gotta make the decision to make some changes and become the change you're looking for. Have a great, great day. We got flyers out, right? Anybody that comes from this meeting that says, hey, I, I got this flyer at this meeting, we're gonna give you 10 extra dollars off your first four weeks of any membership that you choose. <laughs>
Because I am a senior. <laughs> I can tell you. And I've been out here some, in the streets of years. What, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the program again? What? What's the program again? I said senior citizen. Right, 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 right. But you said there's a program out, out right now? Yeah, that's... they have, uh huh. But I, I can't tell you that yet. Yeah. Uh, that's not my plan. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I was asking you. So we're looking to set up a, a program where we have seniors coming in and working on it. It's working as well. So it, 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 sounds, it sounds like he's in the process. That, that, that inquiry, I think, piqued a lot of our ears. I didn't even think about it, to be honest. We're always thinking and seeing the videos of these 20 year olds, and I'm thinking, I can't do that. And I haven't even thought about seniors. So I think you just planted a seed into the kid. Now, uh, he's going to be moving. It sounds like you're, you're going to be moving on that, right? Well, yes, exactly. There's, there's, there's two groups of people who want to reach that we haven't, that we haven't I want to say, taken the opportunity to reach out to. That is both seniors and our youth. Because we wanted to do a youth program after school. Uh, however, we never could get quite to the place where we actually get it done. I want to do it now. And now we think we're in a good area for it. So we do something for the youth at the school. We love to do something midday for our seniors as well. Now, I will tell you this, though. We've got some seniors in our camp that are pretty doggone tough. Here's, here's the thing. Even where we are now, our motto is you do what you can, take you do what you want. Never do less than you're capable of and always do more than enough. So we have we have people in their 60s and 70s that come in and they get that work, but they get it at their level. And wherever you are, that's exactly, you may see the, you may, the videos often will show the people who are decently proficient at what they're doing in the camp, but everybody's in there struggling at their level. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. what, how's coffee? Okay. How's coffee? Is coffee good? Coffee's fine, you just can't cream it up. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have coffee in the back. Yeah. Just to let you know. <laughs> uh, we didn't have it earlier, but coffee is now in the back. We have a question for you. I am Lisa Jennings. I'm the Office Manager of Council Member James Payne, and I can vouch for J.C. Jones Boot Camp. I was a yearly member a few years ago. He gave me a great diet plan. I didn't follow it. A few years later, I was having surgery because I didn't eat right. So... My body came down, I think, at least 25 pounds in the first year. But I didn't follow it. So it's not just what they can give you. You have to be focused and determined and say you want to do this. You don't want to end up in the hospital because of what you've been eating over the past 10, 20 years. Jason Jones is approved. He has people there to help all age brackets because it's hard. But the person next to you will assist you. That's what they did. That's what they do. I'll be back six, in about six months when I'm able to do it again. All right. All right. Just a moment. I'm Lee Cora Williams, and I want to let you know that we do have a senior program in Brightmore. We're called Seniors of Go Go. Okay. And so I will give you the information so that you can. And it is a group of seniors that are ready to do some exercise. My second question to you, well, my question to you is, do you have a senior um, discount rate? Yes. Okay, thank you. Right. You, you, you want to share it? I, I would like to, but, I, but all the whole way she... Okay. <laughs> so in other words, you got to come in, right? Yeah, come in. Uh, I remember, I was, yeah, we, got a, we put together a bunch of different discounts and gave them what's worth while. I know it's a good one. Yeah, I want to be here. Uh, I was wondering, do you have the uh, silver sneakers discount? We don't. Um, I've been wanting to look into that. And I'll, I'll find out when I have one of uh, somebody look in to see what that, how that actually works, but we don't have that. Yeah. Okay, so what is the silver sneaker discount? It's the same discount that comes through the services and I'm not sure how it works. Yeah. I just heard a lot of folks asking that question. Yeah, and uh, the second thing is, uh, as Laura was talking, I do have the senior uh, survey, so if the seniors fill this out, the Brightmore community can possibly get a discount through that, but it depends on how many surveys we get back. So if anybody wants a survey, I have it there. All right. Got another one over here. Just to um, reiterate about the Silver Sneakers program, mm -hmm. my, mom is, my mom is a senior, and she had 
retire from Christ. So it's the big three, they're offering this because they do believe in fitness and in health. Okay. So they're offering this, this healthy program for the retirees and the seniors. Okay. That's something you might want to do. So give us a little bit more uh, information on where we can find you. How can we contact you? One more time. Okay, we're at 16219 West McNichols between St. Mary and Murray Hill. Uh, we're on Facebook, official J.C. Jones Bootcamp page. And then we're also on Instagram, J.C. Jones underscore bootcamp. So if I see anyone else, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think you probably picked up about two, three, four, five, six. I can see them. All right. Coming up next, we're going to move a little bit further down the agenda. We're still waiting for one of our presenters to show up today. They're on their way, though. We want to move down to our DPSC D update. And very, 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 very critical information that's going to be provided. And uh, we're just thankful for the Deputy Superintendent, Ms. Arana, uh, Araneta, excuse me, Wright, who's here to give us a presentation, give you the update on DPSC D, where we are, where we plan to go. And then also, I'm sure you're looking for some feedback from residents as well. Superintendent Wright. So good morning. Um, you may have met Deputy Superintendent Ironetta Wright, then you would know that I am not quite her. But <laughs> that is very much okay. I enjoy being me. Um, thank you so much. My name is Kristen Howard. I am Special Assistant to the Superintendent. Our Superintendent is Dr. Dr. Nikolai VT. And so Mrs. Wright is actually parking right now. She will be coming in shortly. We're gonna share with you a little bit about the current state of our schools. As many of you may know, and these are things that she will now not have to go over. Uh, about two years ago, at the beginning of 2017, the school district returned from something called emergency management and state control. It returned to local control. Control. And so we got our first Board of Education, fully elected Board of Education, in about 10 years. And they also had their opportunity to choose with community input through public meetings a, super, a general superintendent. And so in 2017, we started with our board. In May, they selected a superintendent, and he started shortly thereafter. And through the next few months, he began to build a staff and determine what needed to be done to really serve his community and focus on education. And so now, Deputy Superintendent Wright, she manages our school. So all of our principals eventually report up principals. We have principal leaders in each of our areas who then report up to our Deputy Superintendent. So she's gonna share with you a little bit about what has happened in those last two years, some of the programs and opportunities, and what we're looking to do to go forward, and how DPSCD is really ready to serve community in new and creative ways. So without anything further from me, here's our Deputy Superintendent, uh, Mrs. Ironetta Wright. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? So I ran four miles this morning, and I thought I was going to be here early, and I'm a few minutes late, so I do apologize. Um, thank you so much for having us here this morning, and thank you for your continued support of Detroit Public Schools Community District. You know, it is an honor uh, to serve our children every single day. On yesterday morning, uh, we had the privilege of recognizing a population of students that were in a shared program between Wayne State School of Medicine, uh, Wayne Mental Health Authority, and DPSCD. And those young people, about 67, 70 of them, for the summer are doing an internship at Wayne State uh, School of Medicine. And at the end of that, they will get a nice stipend. Um, but they're doing partner work with um, our doctors from Wayne State. And I said to them, as I was looking at them, you all look so excited to be here this morning. It was the day after school was out. And they were, <laughs> and they were there right and early. So wow, so much um, has happened um, since uh, over the last two years. Uh, we, are com we just completed our second year um, with our superintendent, as Kristen Howard shared with you. Am I clicking? 
um, quicker. Okay. So one of the things that we are really excited about. How much time? Oh, and that includes questions. No, no. Oh my. Oh right, that's a long time. I like it. Okay. So one of the things that we're really excited about is in conjunction with our school board, we do have a united vision and a united mission, and it is important that we recognize that all of our students deserve the very, very best that we have and that we're committed to providing that for them every day. And so we want to make certain that in our mission that we empower all of our children in every classroom, every day, to build a better Detroit. Yes, we want them to go out into the world and do amazing things, but we also want them to be productive citizens right here in our very own community. So we definitely say that we are on a journey. And when we think about this work in terms of transformation and rebuilding, we, we think about it in a traje trajectory. So where have we started? What are we doing? What's next? What's our plan? And how do we then sustain that work? So we're right at the beginning of year three. At the, very, at the, at the first year, really, it, it, it's about building trust. We know that we were, in the first year, we're just coming off of the era of emergency management, and we know the challenges that our community had gone through just through the era of, of emergency management. With a new board, an, an elected board, an appointed superintendent, the very first thing that we have to do is build trust. And build trust from the community, build trust with our own core group, build trust with teachers. And so one of the things that we often heard in year two uh, was, you told us that you were going to do this in year one. And then in year two, you actually did this. And that's what trust is all about, right? I'm not saying that we're completely there, but we're well on our way. When we think about our programs, and it'll come up in just a moment, but when we think about our programs, when we think about the work that we've done around really working with our board and our union to increase teacher salaries, uh, when we think about the way that we are addressing the challenges that we have, value, you look at what they spend money on, right? So how do we realign our budget? What have we done in terms of our schools to make certain that we are uh, being as resourceful as possible, but that we're also being good stewards of what we're doing? Now we're moving to proof points. Just this week, our, 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 as I just shared, our last day of school was on Thursday, and our superintendent is not one that just leads from the district office, and our district office is in the Fisher Building. Our superintendent leads from schools. And the most exciting thing about that work is you can do a lot of planning and organizing and talking about what you want to see happen. But where you really see it happening is in school buildings, right? And this week, Wednesday and Thursday, as we were rounding out the school year, our team, including our superintendent, spent time going into school buildings and just recognizing them for the work that they're doing, whether that's academic performance, academic achievement, whether it's attendance, because we've really seen an improvement across the district of students actually coming to school, whether it's improved enrollment, recognizing that we're on the right track and we want to continue to pour into you so that you're continuing to do good work. So, and, and as we continue from there, year, year three is about proof points. Year four is about scaling. So this year, we're really spending time, these are the things that we put in place in terms of foundations. These are the foundational things that we put in place. Now, let's see the data that goes along with those to say, this is what you've done. Now, what is the data saying about what you've actually had happen? We're beginning to see some proof points now, but we need another year of that to really look at authentically what that data is about. And then we go to scalability. So now we've, we've done this work. We've done this work in our population of schools. How do we continue to scale that work? How do we continue to make certain that it's a part of our overall thread of what we're doing? And year five is about refining. Because at that point, we're continuing to refine what's already happened, looking at our data, doing analysis, and making certain that we're continuing to sharpen the side. <coughs> so transformation begins with culture. And uh, how many educators do we have in the room? Educators. So um, this is my 27th year doing this work. I started when I was 12. <laughs> All right, you'll, you'll get that when you get home. Right? Um, and so one of the things that we know about that as a classroom teacher, I was a math teacher, I, I was a principal for 14 years, I served as a, um, a district leader for a period of time. And one thing that you know is you would see really, really wonderful teachers. They were great with pedagogy, they were great with presentation, but if you couldn't get the students to sit in the seat and actually listen to what was happening, then learning never took place. It's the same thing when you think about culture in a school building. 
If we don't have culture that is conducive to learning, then learning doesn't take place for our children. It may happen by happenstance, but it's not intentional. So we want to make certain that as we start, as we build from the floor up, that we start with one of the most important things, which is override, overall school climate and culture. And to that point, we engaged internal and external stake stakeholders in that work. We were able to refine our student code of conduct. I'm not saying that we're there yet. I'm not saying that we're there yet. But the student code of conduct uh, at this point does include restoration. How do we build our children? How do we teach them that, the, the, that some of the decisions that they make are not the best decisions, but they're also not the end of the world? And just because you make a, make a, a poor choice, failure is never final, and success is the only option. And so the more that we actually work with that through our school buildings and we encourage our staff and provide professional development for them, it really allows us to address the whole child. To that point, after refining the student code of conduct, you then look at how are you supporting schools? So we can think about um, the, what we want to have happen for them, but if we don't provide the structures for it to actually happen in the school building, then the chances are it's not going to happen. So we reorganized funds and in each school building. Um, we included a culture team, and that culture team includes the dean of culture. Uh, each of our schools has an assistant principal. Um, that that, that uh, additional culture team includes a dean of culture, who's really another person in the building that's responsible for building relationships with students. How many had deans when they were in school? Anybody had deans in school? Well, I had a dean when I was in school. And my dean, it was only about discipline. Now, I happen to be a student that didn't have to see her a whole lot. Um, my sister, not so much. But um, it was just about discipline. Well, this is about discipline, but not just about discipline, because we want to make certain that we're building healthy relationships with students and families, and that we're helping them really understand what's happening in the school environment. Each of our schools also has a school culture facilitator. So as in the school culture facilitator's role, is, you know, students do make poor choices sometimes, but in our previous code of conduct, we didn't have a lot of options for discipline. Either a student received a short-term suspension, they received a long-term suspension, or they were expelled. Now I'm gonna replay that. A short-term suspension, a long-term suspension, or they're expelled. In a community whose chronic absenteeism rate is the highest in the country. So we want to make certain that while we honor what's happening with teachers and we provide professional development for working with students, we also want to make certain that we're doing as much as possible to keep students in school in a learning environment. And the way that we've done that is by adding a school culture facilitator whose responsibility is to oversee in-school suspension, help students, help students process what they did that was not right, encourage them, do restorative circles with them, and then move them back into their <coughs> school environment. We also have an attendance agent in every one of our schools. And, and we are pleased to say that that's one of the proof points that, we've already, that we're already seeing. We see an increase in daily attendance and we see a decrease in chronic absenteeism across the district. Across, I think that is yeah. yeah. right. We don't celebrate ourselves. So we're right. The other thing that we've also done, and, and I almost left out, in each of our schools, we also have a guidance counselor. In several of the schools that have guidance counselors or would generate more than one guidance counselor, they also have a school social worker. So really giving resources to schools to help, to help them um, restructure culture and really work through cultural experiences. We, we were also able to launch our parent academy. We extended um, um, our, our PTAs across the district. We increased, well, we actually started last year our school advisory councils as well. And this is an opportunity really for us to engage with the greater community and with the parents. We, are, we want to make certain that we're one team and one voice. And, and so that really gets us started with much of our work. When we think about attendance, I just referenced this. So when we think about attendance, as of March 2018, we were at 33% of our students that were chronically absent across the district. And chronic absenteeism essentially means that they've been out of the school, out of school 10% of the school year. So in a 180 day school year, they've been out of school 18 days or more. And if they're not in school, regardless of what we do academically, it's not going to help them. While we're not there yet, improvement is important. And as of this March, we were at 26% chronically absent. Thank you, I appreciate that.
We also think about discipline, and you heard me talk about the revamp of our, our code of conduct and students being suspended from school. In April of 2018, we had over 17,000 suspensions. I know, right? Not quite where we want to be, but down 27%. And so this, this April, we were down to 12,000 of our students that have been suspended. And fewer suspensions with time away from school, so a reduction of 63%. So that's also important for us to share. And you can clap whenever you like. Thank you. So we also want to make certain we reference parents and parents as partners. And, and through our Parent Academy, essentially our Parent Academy offers a series of sessions and activities, um, information for parents, sessions where we're talking to parents about, about discipline, about um, restorative practices, about their own levels of education and what they need as support as a parent. We had sessions that covered preparing taxes. Even so, really looking across the board at what would happen for parents and how we can help parents uh, feel better informed about what's happening in the school system so that they also know that they can serve as their child's advocate. And we want them to be able to, to, to do that. So, this, this year, this year alone, we've had over 6,000 parent academy participants with a, with a parent academy that just launched last year. And I do believe that that's huge. <laughs> Another proof point for us that's really so exciting as we think about even building culture, and it does become engagement um, with families as well, but it's also very cultural, is our parent-teacher home visit program. And so this is essentially where teachers go to parents' homes to meet with them and talk to them about their child. And I think about as a school principal and as a school teacher going into the home, there was something very rewarding about going into a home to actually sit down and have a conversation about the child. And this year alone, we've had over 3,000, 3,401 home visits where teachers and administrators are going to parents' homes to talk to them about their students. And I think that that's absolutely amazing. And we're continuing to grow. We're continuing to grow. At the end of this year, all of our schools will have an active school advisory council as well as active school PTAs. And that actually was an initiative that started last year that we're really excited about. So our transformative culture, uh, I'm going the wrong way. So all in all, as we look to what's next for transformative culture, diversity, equity, including, inclus, in, inclusion, and restorative practice training for uh, across our district, as well as continuing to refine our code of conduct. We just went through an additional code of conduct revision uh, that will go to the board uh, this summer, and we want to continue to make certain that we're doing that. We're also looking at alternative settings for our students. Um, so even, even sometimes students that do make poor choices in school and they have to be removed from the school building, um, we only want, the, only the most egregious things should really have a child expelled from the school district. So we're looking at alternative programs where we can keep them enrolled in the school district even if not in that particular school environment. So we brought back online this year, um, at the beginning of the year, the name of it was Katherine Ferguson. You may remember Katherine Ferguson. Um, the name of the school now is Legacy Academy, and it's Legacy Academy Alternative School. And that is for students that have had some challenges in school where they've been removed from their school environment, but we can still keep them in a productive school environment within the district. So that's one of our alternative programs. Continuing to look at alternative programs for our over age students. We currently have Detroit Lions and Westside Academy that we're continuing to work through and work with that. Anti-bullying is one of the big ones. Big five minutes total? Okay, more. Okay, I'm going too slow. Too fast. Okay, so we also have uh, anti-bullying work that we're continuing to do as well. So as we think about our outstanding achievement, our data, um, our, our areas that we're focusing on in terms of that, 
we're beginning to see proof and uh, proof points in terms of academic performance and what's happening for students. Um, we, we survey students across the district. We survey students, parents, and teachers. And in our survey ratings, this year, over 98% of our population of teachers and students actually responded to our surveys and responded favorably about where they are, how they're feeling about the curriculum. We did um, launch a new K-8 curriculum this past year, and it was absolutely amazing in terms of doing that. We're looking for our students to be stronger readers, stronger writers. We want them to be proficient in mathematics, and we're continuing to improve partnerships across schools and across school buildings. Our whole child commitment is really important. I know I have two minutes, but I'll, this is the last thing I'll share before I think my time is up or I'm, I'm doing the question piece. Okay, um, our whole child commitment is absolutely amazing. So last year we shared with, with our staff that we would have a cultural passport program. And essentially what cultural passport does is it offers opportunity to our students to go to cultural experiences in Detroit, our K-5 students. Last year we launched off with three, three uh, through fifth grade, third through fifth grade students. They did um, at least one experience. This year we expanded that. Every one of our K-8 schools has art or music and PE uh, in the school building. Um, every one of our high schools has either art or music in the high school and physical education as well. And all of our K-5 students have experienced three cultural experiences, three field trips in Detroit to partners, DSO, DIA, MOT, the, 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 the library, um, the hands-on museum, Henry Ford, all of those different places that they sometimes have not experienced at all. And so they get at least three of those each year that's paid for by the school system because at the end of their elementary experience, we want them to know and understand that there is a lot outside of what they're seeing within their neighborhoods that we want them to experience. So again, thank you so very much. There's a lot and there's so much to share and there's so much amazing work that's happening. I in in invite you to follow our work at, at DetroitK12.org um, on our, at, at uh, DetroitK12.org, www.DetroitK12.org um, for the website. Um, and if you are on, on Twitter or any of those places, it's at DetroitK12.org. Uh, thank you so much and no. Okay, all right. All right. I, know, I know that we're going to have a lot of questions. It's okay. very, 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 very rare that we have this opportunity to talk to you. Yeah. Please. Because yeah. <laughs> you have some very good news to tell. Question number one. Excellent. What about the third grade readers? I understand that they're going to be um, not passing that they pass, don't pass the third grade reading when you come to do it over. What's going on about that? Yes, so Michigan has a third grade reading law, which essentially says that if students don't make a particular score on the M step in, in third grade, then they're not promoted to the next grade. Um, our superintendent shared at our school board meeting on just Tuesday night that we now have additional information around what that looks like. And we have a bit of experience with um, the, the reading laws and how um, students are not promoted as a result of it. So there are additional options for that. Um, I don't think we have it right here on our screen, but on our website, uh, we put all of the updated information for the third grade reading law. So essentially, it's not just about it, the M-step piece. So there's an opportunity for students to do portfolios. Um, there is an opportunity for um, um, students to provide additional information. The other thing that's really big about the third grade reading piece is the newest information that came out is a teacher has to be in agreement with it as well. So it's not just an automatic. So it gives some different options. It's looking at different areas of growth as well. So recently we've gotten updated information and that was just shared at our board meeting on, on Wednesday. We have been working on this, however. When we realized that the reading law was coming, we started our work immediately. And actually, uh, Detroit Public Schools Community District became uh, one of the leaders with Michigan for the work that we were doing around our IRIP. And so essentially, we started planning right then um, the assessment that we use, our, our internal assessment. Um, we looked at students that were not on grade level. We started that two years ago. 
students that were not on grade level and begin to do individual work with them. We have interventionists that are in school buildings that are working with students around their reading deficits. And so we really do believe that as we continue to do the work, we're really focusing on what's happening for the students in the class. Um, I just adopted um, a young man named Jerry O. Rice. He's okay. bipolar, autistic, and he's high functioning. He can't. He's in the eleventh, and he'll be going to the twelfth grade. But he he doesn't even know how to write his name. So um, I I understand um, talking with the administrators at the school. Um, there is no there was there's no summer school program for him. What because I'm new at this. Um, I have no children, and he was getting ready to opt out of the system, so I took him in. What do I do? Because right now, it, it's very challenging for me to try to get him some outside help, and I don't have any resources. And it seems as if everybody at the school that I was asking for information to keep his mind, um, you know, productive during the summer, what resources do I have? I don't know where to go. I don't know who to turn to. Can, can you help me with that? Yeah, so the first thing that you want to do, so we start, so in terms of summer school, um, summer school is one of those things across the state that is not funded. It's not a funded program during the summer. So really what we've engaged with around students um, is really working with students that would otherwise not be promoted, okay, would otherwise not be promoted to offer them some additional services in time. For our K-5 students, we are in partnership with the Summer Fund Centers with the city um, so that there is still some enrichment opportunities that are happening for them. Specifically for students with special needs, though, it depends on what's in their IEP. So special needs students are in a 200-day program already that's a part of their IEP. So while school stops for them on the 21st, it picks back up for them at the beginning of July. So what, I would, so what I would recommend that you do is have conversation at the school site. We can get your information today. I can have my senior executive director of special education contact you uh, because those programs run almost in a year-round kind of format. It very much depends, though, on what's in the student's IEP because because of their IEP, we do have extended services for special education students during the summer, but their IEP would have to call for it. Okay? Yes. We will, if you can, yes, if you'll just see her, she'll get your information and get it to me and I'll have Ms. Uh, Zoma contact you. And at the very end of this, I'm also going to give my email address to everybody. Awesome. Okay. Hello. Hi. My name is Vernon Adams. I'm a grandparent, parent of a six and cat student. And I have two quick questions. Okay. One is, how much leeway do teachers have as far as grading now? Because so much equipment in the computer and that's how we got it out. And for us that just graduated maybe three years ago, like me, um, the teacher had a lot of leeway to say if a student was productive and tried and tried and tried, the teacher might give them a C, maybe a D instead of an F. And now I think um, I heard that they, it's hard to do that. And another question is, this is my pet peeve. We have programs for the A students, the brilliant students, the 4.0s, but we have the resources for the L, you know, the failing students. What about the average? kid who's trying hard to get that C. I never hear anything about building those kids up or giving them motivation to keep trying. You always hear about the A or the failing student. Got a lot of questions in there. I'm going to try to make sure I answer each one of them, okay? So the first thing is teachers are completely responsible for their grades. So that's to answer the first part of your question. There is not, uh, there is a grading system, i.e. 90 to 100 is an A, 89 to an uh, 89 to an 80 is a B, that kind of thing. But in terms of how students are actually graded, that comes from the teacher. Okay, all right, that's the first. The second thing is when we think about students collectively, our goal is to address the whole child. So when you look at our areas of focus, it's really looking at all students, how we're providing quality experiences for students that are are your A students or students that are struggling academically, as well as students that are in the middle. Each of our, we are, we are a PBIS district, which stands for Positive Behavior Supports District. District. So we're really looking at schools. Each of our schools has a PBIS plan. So some of you may have heard, how many of you have, have students or grandchildren or children currently in one of our schools right now? 
okay? Or you have a neighbor or somebody that has a child in one of the schools yes. right now, okay. So one of the things that you hear about is we are looking to recognize students um, for everything that they do. And so while every child may not be the A student, um, we recognize students for attendance, we recognize students for, for behavior, positive behavior, improved behavior, and it's continuing to work with schools around that. Each school has a plan to make certain that they're working with the students because we want to recognize them for what they do. That's, that's the issue, we don't hear it. Okay, all right. So one of the things that you would likely know as well this year is, is um, Flix has a new principal that's starting this year. Um, Zatia Hogan is the new principal of Flix. Uh, we'll continue to work with Flix and with Renaissance and all of our schools because we do want you to know about what's happening from the inside out. Um, we had, we had um, positive behavior incentives at the end of the year, for example. And some of the schools, based on points the students had earned, whether it was for good behavior, whether it was for great citizenship, whether it was for improved performance, at the end of the year, schools began to do field trips and those kinds of things for students. And we began to get some concerns from parents because we were doing that. Um, we're recognizing students for those things. So I think it's important that we continue to educate around why we're doing that because you want to make certain that students know that they're valued and that from the inside we're valuing what you're doing. So we'll continue to work with that. Um, I, my name is Kimberly Clemens and I'm an employee of UPS. But I really just wanted to say first thank you, um, Councilman Tate, for even inviting um, DP as out because to hear this, um, it is truth. What you guys are doing is what I see in the schools. It, it really is amazing because I'm, I'm not just an employee. My son just graduated from the all-male academy, Frederick Douglass. So to be an employee and a parent, I want to say you really are doing exactly what you've shown on the um, video. So um, the programs for the special ed students, our kids were swimming, they were bowling, they were partnering with the autistic um, children. The teachers are motivated, the principals are motivated. The kids are going on field trips. I mean, I am really excited to be a part of that, to hear what you're doing and to really do it. I wanna say that if you can continue to come out in the community, because going to the board meetings, they are a little challenging. We don't get to hear all of the good things that are happening. So if you can continue to do this, then the community can learn more about what's happening on the inside. That's a testimonial. Pardon me, I, I, I know better. I'm gonna talk about it. I got a crossover, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you, Councilman. Well, hello. This is so neat. I didn't know you were gonna be here, so I don't know who was coming to the Citizens Detroit dinner on this past Thursday, and there was a fire. And she and I were supposed to be on the panel. Right. That's right. gonna be my first time really meeting you. I know I've seen you, but that was gonna be fun. So this is neat. We get to still be together. Um, so I'm Stephanie Young. I just happen to be the executive director of the Community Education Commission, the new nonprofit that was started last summer. We're just all about eliminating barriers to education our children face here in the city of Detroit. We work with both DPSD as well as the charter schools. And so I just had a simple question because I'm really excited about the decrease in the suspensions. And I'm wondering if you all have had an opportunity to perhaps identify a why, you know, the, the root cause of some of these suspensions, so that you know how to hone in to perhaps correcting some things there, and then are you able to point to uh, instituting restorative practices as one of the reasons why we've seen that decrease? And I just want you to know also, as I sit on the Schultz uh, Community Advisory Council as one of the alumni, so I'm all in, so I just need to know that. So, yes and yes, um, we have disaggregated the data around discipline, and I think two things have happened. One of the things that's happened is, yes, one of the things that's happened is when we restructured the code of conduct, um, we put in the expectation for restorative practices prior to a student just being suspended from school. 
So we trained staff on restorative practices. We have more work to do with that. Uh, but we did start train, we trained staff on restorative practices. We've also disaggregated the kinds of infractions that students are being suspended for. And so we're actually, it started on yesterday and continues through next week and throughout the summer where we're working with our administrators and our deans on really helping them understand those areas. Uh, this year we also, we started about May, but we're going to full K-8 uh, for next year and we're looking for our high schools that would like to participate as well. But we're going to an initiative called Calm Classroom as well because we really want to teach students about mindfulness. You know, many of our children, they don't know, they don't have the coping skills to deal with some of the things that begin to happen when they get agitated. They get agitated, they get frustrated, they get upset with their friend, and so they don't know how to really back up from that and take a deep breath before moving forward. And so we believe that it's a part of our responsibility to help them, help teach them that as well. And so some of the strategies that we're looking at moving into next year, we believe will continue to do that. We're also continuing to work with our staff. We, we meet with our principals, with our superintendent, uh, about once every three to four months in what we call what's been, what's been coined in our district as data com. And so essentially, And we really look at what's happening in the school with discipline. We're looking at schools that are like schools. And if, if school X is having improvement, then we expect And if not, then we need to assist them in, in planning because the support should be moving in the right direction. And so we'll continue to disaggregate that data. Um, the other thing that we, we believe is, is causing um, the decline is educating staff around what things really, we believe collectively as a district would warrant a suspension. and you go to our state of the schools, you would hear from some of our deans of culture, for example, that are talking about how they've seen changes in their building around the work that they're doing with. All right, because we got a big agenda here. Uh, we're gonna make sure that you're available. You did say you would be available via email and your folks will be here as well. So we're gonna have to move the agenda along so we got time for three questions. The special participation guide the survey, 90% is great. Um, what I what I'm most interested in. Are there programs, curriculums, guidance for them to be able to go out and acquire marketable skills that they can obtain to be able to be productive once they get out of school, if they can afford to? do that, but not everybody can go to college right out of school, and so I was wondering if there was there an opportunity for them to be able to obtain some sort of, you know, training towards that goal. Because there are just so many wonderful things. Th thank you. There are just so many wonderful things that are happening for our district that we really are looking to address. The whole uh, Randolph and go like it. And so in those school environments, students go to their comprehensive school during the day or, or during the day, morning or afternoon, and the opposite time from there, they can go to, to one of the career and technical centers and actually work on trade kind of work. So we have um, 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 auto, auto mechanics, so we have a lot of the trade type, thing, type things in the career and technical centers. We're also expanding our career academies in our comprehensive high schools. So essentially a student is in their comprehensive school, but they want to work, um, but they want to have some extension work for an area of interest. So they have a STEM interest, they have a STEM focus. So we're partnering with WC3 and in some of our other um, where 
whether that's an initial certification that they can go out immediately and get a job, or it rolls into what would be a two-year certification for them so that they are prepared when they leave the school district to move into the world of work. The other thing don't have to pay to go to school. There is Detroit Promise. If our students are eligible for Detroit Promise and they live scholarship. So one of the things that we've really started to really um, pay quite a bit of attention to in the district, students have to have a certain GPA and they have to have a certain uh, score on the SAT or the, or the ACT. So what we're beginning to work with these are the students that have the test score but not the GPA. These are the students that have the GPA, but not because we don't want an option taken away from them when really it's a matter in some instances of retaking a course possibly or sharing with the child up front, this is what you really need and then you're eligible for that scholarship. All right, we have one here. When I was in high school, I took a part in So I wanted to know like how is the district promoting events like that and are you guys thinking about strategic partnerships with maybe like a Mosaic Youth Theater or Detroit Youth Choir and kind of like supplementing what you don't have available uh, currently in schools? So um, arts, uh, the, the work that we're doing around arts um, is, is one of the areas of work. with arts really makes me smile. Um, we have, we have, we, last year when we spoke with our art partners in the community, your, your, your Detroit Institute of Art, your Mosaic, your Mokawabic, and all of those places about what we were planning to do with arts, um, I didn't think that they were going to be able to contain the excitement. This year when they've actually seen it, it's been amazing. So not only do we partner with those art organizations, we actually have something that's really important. So while we're doing extension work with our community partners, it's important for them to have an art instructor in their building. We just had Evening of Fine Arts um, at the end of May. Uh, we're doing a pathway uh, project right now as we are, are rebuilding and restructuring what's happening in DSA and expanding that to our four feeder schools that are also art-specific schools, moving up into that pathway. Um, and it's connecting with all of the art partners across the district. And so it's, it's really been exciting work. Um, schools, you'll see a nice picture of me there, I'll smile, um, but go, go to arts and you'll see a complete list of our art partners and you also will see the ones that are supporting our, supporting our cultural passport program. Last question here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think this guy's, uh, this gentleman's uh, question is the most important one that's been asked in my opinion. Uh, I think the, uh, I'm in a position of hiring. Uh, young people in the city, and I see that a lot of the people are going to vote tech after school and haven't had any baseline in high school. I believe that, like, uh, as we had uh, antiquated systems like shop and home ec in the past, I think a baseline to have the ability to use a hammer or, a, or whatever. So that's, that's, that's uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the visions that we have for one of our schools moving into next year and actually for the information on it, but it's just that. 
where every student that goes to the school that morning, they would be in a comprehensive school environment, but that afternoon, the entire school population would go to a CTC center so that they are all learning uh, um, within their particular area of focus. So it really removes the, you're going, but I'm not going, and this person's going, we do joint scheduling with the schools so that we make sure that they maximize their opportunities. So that's coming school soon in terms of being able to do that for the whole school. Um, but really, we've really spent a lot of time helping students understand that the option exists for them because there were really still students within our own district that did not know that they had those things as an option. The other thing that it's also done for schools that sometimes had what they consider to be limited electives, it automatically opened the elective options for students and made schools more marketable because they also had those courses that they could attend as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Stephanie Superintendent Wright. So again, uh, as you heard, the community said, come on out. So we invite you and anyone from DPSCD to come out and give a presentation every fourth Saturday we're here or somewhere within the district. And uh, I think you'll see that we have a very willing and able audience to not just listen to you, but participate as well. Once again, how can they get in touch with you? That's what I can do. So let me give, um, so if you go to our school board's website, all of our email addresses are there, okay? Everybody's email address is there. Um, however, I will give you my email address. My first name is Ironetta. It is phonetically correct. My dad's name was Ira. My mom wanted a boy. She got a girl, so I'm Ironetta. I-R-A-N-E. T T A Ironetta dot right W R I G H T. All of our emails end in at Detroit K twelve dot org. So the at sign Detroit K the number twelve dot org. My telephone number it is on the form, and she says it's right on the form that you have right there in front of you. She said, it's on the form. Oh, look at that, resourceful, I love it. So for anyone else that doesn't have the form, I'm sure that you can get one, but my telephone number to my office, my assistant is amazing, so if you call her, she is just going to be awesome with you. Um, uh, the telephone number to my office is 313-873-6893. Which one number, that may be the... That's the main number that's on there. So I just gave you one, I gave you one other number. So the main so the main number is on your form, but this is the number to my office, um, which is 313-873-6893. And you can feel free to uh, send me an email as well. We always respond. We're always working, so I would ask that you give me at least 48 hours to respond to your email, but we do always respond. Thank you, and thank you for, for having me here this morning. Um, and I, the only thing that I would ask in closing is that each one reach one. Go out and tell someone else about the amazing things that are happening in Detroit Public Schools Community District. When you get the information firsthand, much as you share, then you're armed to share with people what is truly happening. And so our school system is on the rise. We're excited about it. We're doing amazing things for students. We just have to do a better job of making sure that the information is out there and available. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. question about the fine arts, arts and performing, music, it was like, hmm, that's called an alley-oop in basketball terms, because we have a young man who actually attends Detroit Public School Community District. He's going to play a little song for you. Now, this young man is named Cameron Morrison, and what's unique about Cameron is, Cameron's 13 years old. Let me give you a little, little information about Cameron. You 14 now? <laughs> he is 14 years old, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a round of applause. 14. <laughs> so 
So Cameron is graduating. Uh, he's graduating yeah, eighth grader from Ludington with a 3.4 GPA. Uh, he has been playing the piano since the age of six. Uh, he started by chance when he met an instructor who told his parents that he had an ear for music. Uh, Cameron's favorite subject is music. His biggest role model is... Really unique. Every day, Cameron travels back and forth from Mount Clemens, from Mount Clemens to Detroit because of the quality education that's being provided. So just what you said is actually in effect right here. He's not going to go to another school. He's going to another DPSCD school, Renaissance. So that's the proof that what's being said is being done. So Cameron, you want to say a couple words to the folks? Yeah, I'm not sure. uh, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, run into this year I graduated and go to Renaissance Motion. Alright. Well, I think you're going to play us a song. I, I think I've heard this song before. I'm not going to say what the song is. I want to see if the people in the audience can pick it up, okay? Y'all give it up for camera again.
As you know, we always make sure that we uh, provide our young folks with uh, award recognition. Uh, we did not have an opportunity to produce it today because a couple of things, our printer got all messed up. But we're going to make sure you get that. But can we, you mind if we take a picture together? All right. alone. Uh, nearly one in four of the folks who will have a stroke will be repeat them. So it won't be their only time having a stroke. It's critical that we know the signs of stroke and how to prevent it and if in fact you end up having some type of stroke, medical condition, TIA, uh, you need to know how to take the steps to recover. And so I'm going to move away from the microphone. Now, Reggie actually had a few words that he wanted to speak on this particular issue. And it's been weighing on our hearts in our office to ensure that we do our best to educate the community. So you really don't see Reggie getting on the microphone. I always have to force him to do so, but this is the one that was on his heart uh, and he wanted to come forward. Reggie. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. Um, Reggie Alexander, Community Coordinator, Office of Councilman James Tate. Um, so as far as strokes go, um, there's something called the trans ischemic attack, and the doctor can give you a better definition than what I'll come up with, but it is akin to what you would call a mini stroke, I guess. It's, it's like you have some of the symptoms of a stroke. In my case, I was at work working in the councilman's office. I was on the phone talking to somebody, and I had a difficulty forming words. It was like I was trying to say something and I couldn't get myself to say it. Um, I got nervous, went to the bathroom, washed my face, looked at my face, because that's the first thing I thought was happening to me. And um, I didn't see any drooping or anything that looked out of ordinary, but I did feel very weird and very kind of uh, out of out of body ish if that's an expression. So I went to the hospital, they did the stroke protocol test, and they uh, determined that there was nothing wrong with me except that I had a trans ischemic attack which is like a stroke, but it doesn't leave the lingering effects, after effects. So I didn't have any mobility issues or speech issues or anything. I had two of those. The urgent care to check on it, and they took my blood pressure and said it was 170 over 110, um, which is high. I went from there to CVS to pick my prescription. I'll give you the abbreviated version. Um, it turned out to be very high. I went to the hospital, they took it, it was 203 over 100 and something. Um, so, very grateful to be here, um, thankful for that. But what I just wanna impart on everybody is if you have to take medication, make sure you take it and take it faithfully. Um, we have a perfect uh, kind of uh, template over this whole meeting with the gentleman who was here earlier with the gym, JC Jones, I mean, we, we need to exercise, watch what we eat, take medication if necessary. If you exercise and eat properly, you can most likely in many cases get off of medication. So I just want to emphasize everybody, if you have medication you have to take, please take it. If you um, are not taking it, thank God you're not taking it. 
strange or something that feels strange, don't run into your doctor's office every five minutes. But definitely you want to make sure that you look into those issues because I was walking around with 170 and 110. I didn't even know it was that high. Um, so um, without further ado, uh, we will move on to uh, Dr. Abishet from uh, Detroit Medical Center. He is the uh, stroke prevention coordinator. Dr. Abishet. Thank you, Councilman Tate and Reggie, uh, for the introduction. My name is Abhishek. Um, we are here, uh, and you've seen me in scrubs today. The reason is that um, I have started a stroke program in San Andreas uh, for about close to a year. And every month we collect our data that what is causing these strokes. And one of the biggest uh, red line was the risk factors for the stroke. So the date is May 4th there, but uh, as we know today is not May 4th. This is, was the presentation I created uh, for our community on stroke month, which was May. And we started a campaign in going out in community and trying to address some of these issues. What does stroke means? What kind of strokes are? How to recognize them? and what are the risk factors for the stroke and how to better address it. So uh, if you guys have a question, please raise your hand and I'll try to stop and answer what your question is. Okay, we'll do the question later. All right, so let's start. So when we talk about stroke or heart attack or coronary event, um, these, are, these have a similar risk factors. And stroke is number fifth killer uh, in the United States. And even if it doesn't kill somebody, it causes a lot of mor morbidity, it, a dysfunction. And that dysfunction is very, very taxing to the patient and the family. And it takes out whatever the life and memories and our uh, being uh, away from us. And that's why, uh, as a neurologist, we are very passionate about um, stroke. So um, in, in heart disease, what's happening is that is, is a, uh, an animation of this cartoon of uh, the blood arteries which supply the heart. And there's a plaque formation or a cholesterol narrowing in the arteries. And it builds up over time. Even a six month old baby, you might find a cholesterol streak in one of the arteries. And over time, if the risk factors are not recognized, by the time we, we are 30, 40, these things will start showing symptoms. If these clots are happening in the heart, it can cause heart attack. And if this is happening in the brain, it can cause clot in the brain. So for heart attack, the uh, symptoms of pressure in the heart, uh, fullness, squeezing pain in the heart, over the chest, and it sometimes it spreads to arms. Sometimes it will just cause a nausea, there's some jaw pain. So it's, it's symptoms vary from person to person. And the sudden cardiac arrest, why I'm mentioning this is that um, it, while we're working in this acute neurological conditions, one of the things I have seen in San Grace in our DMC hospitals is that people young, as young as 35, 45, 50, they are getting these heart attacks. Uh, the heart stops suddenly and there is no recovery. And the reason we found was that these risk factors which is lingering for years and years, uh, it could be high blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, uh, sometimes drugs, and these can, can cause damage and accelerate that process of plaque formation. And it is not recognized. So never think that stroke can happen or a heart attack can happen in 60s, 70s, 80s. It can, can happen as early as 30s and 40s. So uh, it's very important reminder that that's a sudden cardiac arrest. Now, uh, what is stroke is that there are two kinds of stroke. 
one where there's a clot formation, either from the plaque in the neck or the plaque in the brain, or the clot is coming from the heart and with the blood flow is going to the brain. And that is a clot kind of stroke. Uh, and the other kind of stroke, then there is a rupture in the artery. Due to an aneurysm or balloon or an abnormal connection in arteries or veins. So there's a two kind of stroke. Both of them are very devastating. The second kind, the bleeding kind, the time we have to treat somebody is within hours. And if it is blood bleeding is not stopped within hours, then we won't be able to, that person is not able to make it. And uh, the brain, every time there's a delay of one hour in strokes, there's a disability of three years, close to three years of disability. So timing is always the key. So in, in, at this point, I want to make a point here is that uh, never drive or think that the symptom will go away. So 911 is the best option. The kind of services we are uh, we have in Sinai Grace and the other hospitals surrounding Detroit and inside Detroit, the the system how we deal with stroke inside the hospital, and the system is better activated or better informed than that it comes that there is an EMS truck which brings the patient in. So never drive, always call 911, and never sleep off on that. Don't think that the weakness which you had just in the morning will go away. Uh, it will always, if there's, a, if there's a signs, always call 911 and go to nearest emergency room. So uh, what are the symptoms and signs of stroke? So the brain has two parts, the right side and left side, and the right side control the right side control the left side of the body, and left side control the right side of the body. So if there's a clot sitting in the, my left side, I'll have weakness in my arm, the facial droopiness or flattening of the face. Speech will be slurred, and particularly in the left side of stroke, there'll be language issue. The person who was talking uh, and able to understand and express himself, that can have no, they, they, will, they, will, they will not recognize any language. The language area is get affected on the left side of stroke. A lot of confusion can happen when you talk to them. Um, the vision is also an important part. Uh, sometimes this, is this right sided field is affected, sometimes left sided, sometimes just one eye can be affected. So no vision at all in those uh, vision areas. Now, uh, particularly in bleeding kind of stroke, where is the blood is flowing and uh, getting into the brain itself, that causes a very bad headache. So people do have headaches, like migraines, uh, general headache, sinus problem. But whenever there is change in character, that is a time uh, aneurysm is changing its shape. That is a time the brain is giving the warning. So you, you might have had a migraine for 10 years, 20 years, and suddenly there is a change in character of the headache. It's more problematic. You can't function. And there is a vision changes, blurred vision, double vision. Those things are, have to be recognized. And uh, it will won't blow away with uh, aspirin or, uh, or pain medication. That needs to be evaluated. Any change in headache characters need to be evaluated for aneurysms or brain problems. Now, as I mentioned, it's a medical emergency, so always call 911 for that. Um, and uh, if you notice one or more sign, more or more signs of stroke, uh, you can always grab that all the medication you have, or when the last time was somebody was seen normal, because as I mentioned. All the treatment protocols or all the treatment available, either by clot busting medication or from my point of view, going inside and trying to take the clot out of the brain or stopping the bleeding, everything is time dependent. So for information which we need as a physician is when the last time somebody saw this person normal. So some our treatments are available for three hours, some are available for six hours, some are available for 24 hours. So there are treatment available, but you got to reach hospital very quick, very fast. Now, the risk factors. So as I mentioned, uh, risk factors. So these are the risk factors which are going to be common in both heart problems, heart attacks, 
and the brain attacks, like stroke, bleeding kind and the clot kind. So the first risk factor is smoking. Now, if we are smoking, if we stop smoking today, in first 20 minutes of stopping smoking, the heart rate stabilizes and there is a breathing gets a little bit better. In the next day or two, there may be some smoke or cough that your breathing system has used to this smoking. The cough will be there. The cough will persist for about a week. And to get down the risk of, if I stop today smoking, or the, the risk of stroke and heart attacks will come down to the normal level in five years. It takes five years to that effect to go away. And it takes 20 years to get the cancer effect go away. So even if you have stopped, so, so if, if you smoke, you better to stop early than late because there's a lag, there's a lag period between when you stop smoking and when the risk will go away. Um, uh, diabetes, one of the commonest thing. Uh, we, we, there's a lot of diabetic population in our community. And if you have diabetes, uh, knowing all of these, Diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, and blood pressure. These are number-based things. So always know your numbers. So what is your number for diabetes? What is your number for blood pressure? What is your number for cholesterol? Though knowing, just knowing those numbers gives a big impact. If you don't know the number, you are at risk of stroke. So when we are getting all these evaluation every year, the doctors are doing these tests. Because these are the silent killers. These are the risk factors which are going to progress suddenly after 10 years of diabetes or 12, uh, 12 years of hypertension. And there won't be any symptom. A lot of times, hyperpressure doesn't have symptoms. As uh, uh, Reggie was mentioning, that there's no symptoms. You'll be sitting here with a blood pressure of 200 without a, a symptom or signs. If it goes more than 200, then sometimes people will have some mild headache or some neurological deficit. So that's why knowing your number is important because numbers, if you know your number, you can monitor it down the line. Um, physical inactivity. Now physical inactivity, as um, uh, our gentleman was mentioning, that is one of the keys. Uh, in, in, in the physical activity does not improves the, your physical strength. It also improves, if somebody had a stroke and is, is very athletic, and he was exercising before, putting a lot of energy in day-to-day -day activity, and spending some time in gym or walking or running, that particular person will recover quicker, fairly quicker, than somebody who was not, who was physically inactive. And there is something between physical activity and brain. Now, just not the, for the muscles and recovery from muscle weakness, it, it, it improves. Sometimes, if you, if you look at it, people who walk or do daily exercises, the chances of depression is less. People have shown that the memory also improves. For some reason, we don't know why, but the memory also improves. There's a decreased risk of dementia if somebody who's physically active. So physically acti physical activity also have some cognitive benefit, or a benefit in memory, benefit in stroke recovery. So there are certain risk factors which we can't change. We can't change our age, sex, or race. Uh, family history, we can't change, right? We can't change our mother, father, grandfathers. So that is family history. And uh, any history of previous stroke, any history we can't change. So these are the things we can't change. And uh, the as a, when we, what I do is we, I go through the leg and try to remove clots. And uh, in African American population or a Mediterranean population or an Asian population, these are the population where we see a lot of blockages in the brain itself. And those are the toughest clot to remove. We have to struggle hours and hours to remove those like clots. They're very tough clots. So there's a, there's a racial disparity between how are the reason for the stroke. Because it, if, if I'm spending a lot of time in removing the clot from the brain, then it means that I'm not going to be able to successful down the line. But that also matters. So what can you do to prevent 
heart disease or stroke. So uh, exercise, eat healthy, diet, take control of your weight. Very important, take control of the weight and uh, quit smoking. Uh, if you haven't done it now, or if you know somebody who haven't done it now, advise them. Nicotine is more addictive than cocaine and heroin. It's very difficult to take it out. It requires seven to eight attempts for an average individual to quit smoking. Uh, monitor your blood pressure, always know your numbers. You've got to know your numbers. If you're more than 30, you've got to know your numbers. Then find what, where you can start. Find out your family history. Talk to mother, grandfather, father, and see what, what kind of problems they had. Because that also in, increases the risk of stroke. If they had a stroke, you can have a stroke. See your doctor regularly. When you go to annual physical physicals, make sure that you at least see your, if you don't have any problems, see your doctor at least once a year. And know your risk factors. Control your risk factors after knowing them and know the warning signs. Looks like we have five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just gonna mention this. Uh, these are the signs how to recognize stroke. So a face, flattening of the face on one side, weakness, slurred speech, and then the last one is the time, it's called fast. Face, weakness, slurred speech, and the time. Time is very important in strokes. And always call 911. Never start driving. This is an example of how the facial weakness will look like. That the one side will be flattened. This is the drift in the arm. And speech. Stuttering speech, one word answer, inappropriate words. So these things will tell me that there's a language area is involved in the brain. So uh, in Sinai Grace and most of the 21st century hospitals, they are uh, imaging cap capacity, clot removal technologies are available in most of our hospitals. So when you go there, so there is, even if the last time normal was about 10 hours ago, still there are something we can do about it. We can do these uh, specialized CAT scans and angiograms and figure it out whether we can remove the clot or not. So never say that a lot of times, and always demand for it. Always, when you go to it with a patient, when you have loved ones have these kind of problems, always ask these questions, whether there's something can be done or not. Because science is moving very quickly, and we have more advances in medicine where we can provide more and more treatment. At this point of time, we are treating anybody who has within the last 24 hours of stroke. So, let me know. All right. Any questions? mentioned a moment ago about there's specialized tests or specialized screens. I know that sometimes when you go for these different types of tests, insurance coverage wise, a lot of times they don't cover certain things because they refer to it as the verbiage is uh, experimental. So with these special no, tests. These, these tests are standard of care now. Okay. So uh, like CAT scans, CT scans, MR, certain MRIs, they are standards now. Okay, and, and so there has to be a reason for it, mm -hmm. and if there's a reason and a logical evaluation behind it, uh, insurance company cannot deny it. So is it best to check first Correct. if the, the, the person who's coming for these specialized tests to verify if it's covered? Because a lot of times when patients go for these certain screenings, mm -hmm. they don't find out until it's time to check out right. if they have a higher copay because mm -hmm. again, perfect example, mammograms versus a 3D image mammogram. Right. Right. And you end up Certain tests we do in acute setting, 
when something bad is happening. And to all those tests are covered uh, with most of the insurance company. Sometimes um, if we do a test a few more times, like a CAT scan which is done multiple times, insurance company can deny a few of those CAT scans. But the, if there's a reason to do it, and we can do it four CT scans or CTAs in a day, but if there's a reason for doing it, and it's well documented, so most of the times it's a documentation, documentation issue. And if we have a proper documentation, those tests uh, will be reversed. So we really want to thank uh, Dr. Abishai for being here because after he leaves here, he actually is going to uh, operate in surgery. So that's how important it was for him to be here this morning. So we don't have time for a lot of questions, but we, got, we do have one over here. Hey, I was just wondering, in your practice, do you still notice how black men do not come to have certain uh, procedures done or follow up on stuff? Yes, yes we have seen it. So uh, in last one year, one of the biggest problems I have faced was the follow-up after it. So as uh, Councilman was mentioning, that it, once you have a stroke, that itself is a risk for a stroke in the next six months. So uh, what we have done is, even after calling multiple times, giving them letters multiple times, people are not showing up. Uh, our clinic is not very far from here. There's a clinic in Santa Grace, there's a clinic in uh, Telegraph and 13, and we had a very hard time. Sometimes there's a lack of understanding that it might come back. And the second is, once you're better, you forget about it. Hi, so my question is very similar to the first question regarding um, coverage. There is something that um, is being advertised, whether it's free or in order and all of that. So I'm wondering, is it worth it to pay out of pocket to use that test? Or does the doctor not recommend? Is it beneficial even if I paid out of pocket? No, uh, we should not be any test. Whenever we do any test, there has to be a probability. And that probability is determined by physician who's taking care of you. So, uh, in, in, for a stroke is such a complicated issue, it will be a wild goose chase. Uh, so uh, you will find something. You, we do a whole body scan, we find a small node or a small cyst somewhere. And then the whole process will start about evaluating that. So I would not recommend. So first of all, if you have risk factors, we should see the primary care doctor first. And then ask them this question. Can I have a stroke? And then ask, they will refer you to a neurologist or stroke neurologist or one of us. And then we can evaluate it. Because then they can be very inappropriate testing. Um, and that can lead to a lot of financial issues. I would not recommend that. People, like, it's, it's not like a, you see all the billboards on varicose veins and uh, all those other procedures out of pocket. Uh, those are for cosmetic purposes. Uh, but the stroke is a pretty, pretty serious thing. If you're not going to a right channel, uh, you're not going to get the worth of your money. All right, so what we have, I think you, everyone should have a sheet of paper document. If you don't have it, it looks like this. You don't have one? Okay, we'll get one over. Just take it here. It's right so there in the back. We'll bring some up to you. So what we have here, we want you guys to fill this out. This is going to allow BMC to provide better service to our community, to know what we're looking for, what we're interested in, and also give an evaluation. I think it's a very informative uh, presentation that we had today. And maybe there's some things that you wanted to talk about and didn't want to say it in front of everybody. This will allow you to uh, make that contact as well, okay? So again, ladies and gentlemen, if you can give a round of applause for Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you are welcome. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Oh, we have, you want to say? Oh, picture time? All right. This is for the records.
last week and they showed up this week. So that shows you how important this is to get the word out to the community. Another very important thing that has been talked about in District 1, um, how many of you are familiar with the speed humps? How many want a speed hump? Oh, more hands go up. <laughs> All right, so speed humps are very, very popular. At least the concept of speed humps. Right now, as many of you know, there was implemented initially a pilot program last year where each district had two locations. There were seven districts, two locations. It means how many? 14 locations. Come on. It is early, I guess. <laughs> so 14 locations. We have now, as City Council, approved uh, a contract for additional speed humps to go around the city of Detroit and various districts, and all of, the, all of the districts, actually. And just to give you an understanding and idea about how popular they are, uh, we checked about two weeks ago, uh, after the announcement was made that uh, you can call in and send the form in, and 150 requests in District 1 alone had come in. And so it gives you an understanding of how challenging the issue is of trying to determine who actually gets the speed humps on their street. But to give you some information, don't put it all on her. <laughs> Deputy Director of the Department of Public Works, this is Caitlin Malloy Marcone. Please give her a round of applause like we do in D1. <laughs> so she's going to give you some information about the speed humps. How do you request for them? What are they? And any other questions that you have regarding them should be able to answer. Thank you so much for having me. And Dr. Green, can I get oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Kayla Malloy Marcone. I'm Deputy Director of the Department of Public Works, and I am overseeing um, the Speed Hump Program and another uh, number of other initiatives for the department. But today we're going to talk about Speed Humps. Um, Get a presentation pulled up quickly here with just a little bit of information. Thank you. So, why traffic calming in Detroit? I probably don't need to explain this to you, uh, but traffic calming is just a fancy word for saying we need to slow vehicles down when they're driving around Detroit. Uh, we need to protect our most vulnerable user, and who is that? That's have the option to be driving around in a vehicle. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, Detroit has the highest amongst big cities, so populations of 600,000 or more, the highest cyclist fatality rate and the fifth highest pedestrian fatality rate. So we are, sorry, closer, closer. Oh, there we go, better? So we are, um, we are killing a lot of our Detroiters just by getting out and walking around or those that are biking around. Um, by people going too fast. Your chance of coming or getting in a collision as a pedestrian or a cyclist and surviving are much higher if that vehicle is going 35 miles per hour or less. Um, as those speeds increase, your chance of surviving that crash obviously decrease. So that's really important. It's also the top complaint we hear from residents in our traffic center um, is that cars are just going too fast. Um, and so that's why traffic calming is Detroit. So what is traffic calming? There's a lot of different things that you can do to calm traffic. Um, obviously you can issue tickets and have enforcement, but you can't have an officer sitting on every corner in every neighborhood. We just don't have resources for that and we probably don't want that anyways. But we can do a lot of things with design. The physical design of our roads leads people to believe that the speeds are much quicker than they should be. When we have lots of lanes and the roads are really wide and there's no physical indicators that I should be going a little bit slower, that leads to people going at a faster rate of speed. When people see cars that are going really fast, they don't want to get out and walk around or bike around, right? They just don't feel safe doing it. So we're doing a disservice on a lot of levels. People are driving really fast, which is dangerous. We're also discouraging the physical activity that we've all been talking about through, during this entire meeting, right? So. What are some physical things? We have some very low cost items that are at the top here, just basic markings, the speed cushions that we're gonna talk about, and then there are really high cost items. Um, some of you have may have been involved in the Grand River Streetscape conversations with MDOT. Some of those are very high cost items. We're putting in islands in the middle of the street so that pedestrians 
only have to cross half of Grand River to wait and then for traffic to clear and then cross the other half of Grand River because it's a very wide road. Um, so there, they, the solutions range from really low cost to really high cost. So as Councilman Tate said earlier, in 2018 we did a pilot with speed humps. Why did we choose speed humps? Because they're relatively inexpensive. They usually can produce 20% speed reduction, 18% volume reduction, meaning oh, we have a lot of streets, a lot of our residential streets, people try to avoid the busier. percent volume reduction of just people that don't live on that street they don't bother going up that street anymore because it's they don't like going over the speed humps right and then we also see a 13 percent crash reduction in uh, on residential streets that have speed humps so they're relatively inexpensive but we see a lot of benefit from them so that is what we chose to do in the 2018 pilot and so in the photograph here um, this is one of our installations. This is what the speed humps look like. We have a piece up here for anybody that wants to touch it or look at it. Um, but what it essentially is is a prefabricated rubber um, that is, um, we use an epoxy to stick it to the ground and then we bolt them into the ground. We also are going to be testing and piloting asphalt speed humps. So if we go in and we read the surface of road and it looks all nice, we don't want to take this and bolt it into the road. So there's a way to build in the asphalt speed humps as well. So you'll see those popping up um, as we move through this program. So the 2018 pilot, we put these out. We monitored them through the winter to make sure that our snow plows were able to still plow our streets with them there. We wanted to see how damaged they got in, the, in our cold weather climate. And at the end of the winter, we went back out. We had to replace some bolts and do some little things here and there, but they, they lasted. They did a pretty good job. And we also talked to the residents um, that were living around those speed pump locations, and everybody said they did just what they were supposed to, that people were going much slower, that they saw fewer cars cutting down their street, if that was the issue. And so overall, we had a pretty successful pilot. And so council, uh, we worked with council to get funds approved, as Councilman said, to purchase additional speed humps and really start an actual program. So in 2019, our program, we have budgeted for 400 locations citywide. That's what we, we are able to do this summer. We're gonna be splitting those 400 locations, obviously amongst the seven council districts. We've created a public submittal portal. So if you go to the city of Detroit's website, DetroitMI.gov, and you click on departments and you find my department, the Department of Public Works, you will find a traffic calming um, link and it will take you to this page and if you scroll to the bottom there is um, a, a button that you hit that says request a speed hump. So anybody can go on there and you can log in your information and we will you know, add, it, add it to the queue to be evaluated and to be considered for an installation. Today, we, I looked, we have over a thousand submissions citywide. So we have 400 locations that we are, we are going to be installing this year with over a thousand submissions. So we had to come up with criteria, uh, first of all, based on safety, and we'll talk about it in just a second, and then um, second of all, just a way to prioritize some of these locations. I am going to guess that because this program has been wildly successful and so many people want them, that we will work with council again to get additional budget for next year and the year after that and to keep this traffic calming program going. Uh, but in the meantime, we needed to come up with a way to decide on locations. So we've got some criteria points here. It must be a residential street, uh, that's key, with a speed limit of 25 miles per hour. Uh, we can't put them on big commercial streets. It's, it's not very safe, um, and so we're concentrating right now on our residential streets. Um, the priority streets are going to be streets that are adjacent to active schools and parks. Obviously, those have a lot more pedestrian and bicycle activity happening around there. We really want to make sure that, that our youth in the city are being uh, prioritized in terms of roadway safety and so if your street happens to be connected to or you live by an active street or a park um, those are some of the priority locations we're also looking at. Daily traffic volumes between 200 and 4,000 vehicles I know that seems like a really big stretch this essentially just means we want to concentrate resources on streets that that enough people are driving down and sure our quieter residential streets that fall below this threshold um, they may have speeding issues too, but if you have a whole lot of cars speeding or just a few cars speeding, we really want to make sure we tackle those areas that have a whole lot of cars 
uh, speeding first. Um, if we have any DPD records of speeding or crash history, uh, we're working with our local precincts to, to take a look at that information as well. Uh, if the street is used as a cut through, right? So if we know that this street has two stop signs and it's, you know, between McNichols and Seven Mile, it's a straight shot. We know that people are using that as a cut through to get from one major street to another. Um, and so that could also be a priority point. And then last but not least, we need to have support of the residents on the block. Um, and so if anybody has spoken out about the fact that they don't want the speed hump, we're really trying to make sure that we're putting these, there are a lot of people that do want them and that we're putting them on blocks that, that have that, uh, that support. So with that, we will be in our crews, our DPW crews will be out installing in District 1, uh, probably starting around Wednesday, I'm hoping. Um, so you will start to see them pop up. Um, if you've already submitted, has anybody in here already submitted their streets on there? Great. If you have not, please get on uh, the portal and submit again. Um, we are trying to do a couple installations in each of the districts before coming back around and going to and uh, doing second installations in the district. So we will be in District 1, we will be releasing um, a map of where those, where those projects will be taking place, um, but I encourage you to uh, submit if you haven't submitted. Um, and that's really it for my, for my first presentation. Sorry, you looking for a sign? <laughs> yeah, 
We're gonna work on that sign for you. But she's the she's talking about the steam humps now. We will work. <laughs> That's the presentation about steam humps. But we'll make sure that we get your information about that sign and we'll bring it forward. Well, All right, I'm on Patton Street, first block of Eight Mile. So at the end of our block, we have a liquor store, a Coney Island, and next to that, a strip club. Not only that, the Michigan Turn is right at the end of our block. So as you can imagine, we got a lot of traffic and it's speeding down to the side street, which is Hessel. I really need three of those <laughs> on, my, on my block alone. My question is, how, I know you have a, a certain criteria, so because I have so many residents that complain about the same thing, you had us, um, you said you would refer us to the site to sign up. I'm sure there's some mechanism in place to where it's, if I got five or six people on my block that's signing up, you're not getting a repeat of the same street. So I'm sure that when those addresses go in, is there some sort of mechanism in place that determines, okay, these are not duplicates, but also it's not pushing us further down on the priority list. So it's actually beneficial if, if somebody is requesting the exact same street or the exact same block. It is linked back to your address, so you can't just go in and you know, put in over and over again yourself. But if all of your neighbors are also saying that there is an issue, that's beneficial. And so it doesn't just come in as a duplicate. It says, you know, this has already been a request made, and then we tally how many people have requested that specific location. And obviously, um, there's only one of me, but we have a council person and a district manager in each of the districts, and so we are also taking the master list. Let's say there's 600 locations that were requested in District 1, and we're gonna be working with the council person's office as well as the district manager to say, okay, you've been to a lot more meetings in D1 recently than, than I was able to get to. Which of these lists have you really heard community outcry about to have them help us prioritize as well? So again, I understand that we probably need these on every block and on every residential street in the city. We had to put a way to prioritize it. Um, but to your point, encourage them to go in with your location as well so that we know that there is community support for that block or that street. So, and this may be a question that some folks are gonna have moving forward. If there is a, uh, and I kind of alluded to it, I haven't heard many people say that they're complaining about the street house, but if there are individuals who have complaints about them and they don't want it necessarily in front of their house, they want it a couple houses down, how would that process work? Is there any type of uh, recourse for that individual, that resident? Depending on the situation of the street. So these are most effective. We have a whole team of engineers that goes out and field, does the field work on each of these locations. And so there, if you want the most effective installation of speed humps, they should be a certain distance apart from each other. We obviously can't put them in front of somebody's driveway. They also need to be a certain distance from a stop sign. And so we have to look at all of this, and so that will determine where specifically on the street and then the cadence of them on that street as we go down, those that, where those will be installed. Now, if it's one resident that just is, I don't want it directly in front of my house, maybe we would be able to shift it one way or another slightly. But again, we're looking at using these dollars to make sure that we're maximizing how effective the system is. And so we want to make sure that drivers are hitting them at a certain cadence and either to discourage them from cutting through a street or encouraging them. Uh, it, I don't know how expensive these are, but with block clubs, or organizations be able to purchase and have them installed themselves if there was a black club? So we have been, that, that request comes up in almost every meeting that I'm at, and so we have been looking, and again, this is a new program for the city, it's a new program for everybody, at how we might be able to, in the future, make that a possibility. We need them to be insult, installed to a specific spec. We need to make sure that the people that are installing them are doing it correctly, because if they're not, then it could be more of a hazard than anything at the end of the day. But we are looking at, in, in the case where there's communities that want to fundraise or do something in order to, to get additional locations, how we might be able to do that the right way. Yeah, so this one I have, you, you're not, you said it's yours, but just 
contribute to the plan. Yes. Okay. okay, first of all, thanks a lot for everything. This. this has been a problem that's been a long time coming. Uh, I can remember the council meeting with then uh, President Pro Tem Gary Brown, and we suggested that the city of Detroit, this is prior to the bankruptcy, that the city of Detroit would have a budget surplus if it just enforced the traffic laws and speed limits on the streets and freeways. He told me without hesitation, you don't want us to do that because then half of your residents would, would be arrested. I said, put them in jail. I don't care. So your speed humps, and I think the council will bear witness, we've been discussing this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, the mayor had a meeting up here, and at that time, they told us it was illegal in Michigan to have it. It's not illegal. They did not want the liability that comes with somebody having a wreck. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world. In Ireland, they elevate the crosswalks, and that becomes a speed hump. For me, from what I've seen, uh, I think they should be at the intersections or as close as possible because you get T-boned and killed going through an intersection, not in the middle of the street.